Welcome back to Radio Signals. My name is Mark, and my call sign is N9WIB. This is the Technician License Series Lecture 9, and today we're going to cover core concepts of antennas. In the first part of the presentation, we will define what an antenna actually is. Then we will reintroduce the concept of polarization, and then review feed line and resonance, and then define gain and the concept of decibels. And then finally, we're going to end with the description of certain radio frequency RF radiation patterns. An antenna is one of the most critical parts of your radio. Without the antenna, you would not be able to transmit a radio signal or receive a radio signal. An antenna is a conductor that radiates and receives radio signals. It is commonly made up of wire, pipes, or rods. And antennas can be built in the size to be a fraction of a signal wavelength. What that means, if you have a very long wavelength such as 160 meters, you can have an antenna that's 160 meters long. But more commonly, the antennas are built to be certain fractions of a wavelength. Take your antenna on maybe your uh, handheld radio or your HT that transmits in the VHF to UHF frequency, that antenna is maybe approximately six inches or a little more uh, in length. So much less than that 160 meter antenna. Another interesting thing about antennas is that they typically transmit a few watts to over a kilowatt in amateur radio. So that's a pretty wide spread. And what's even more fascinating is that amateur radio antennas can receive signals that could be smaller than one 10 billionth of a watt, but yet they can transmit over a kilowatt of energy. That it is a huge range of power. The concept of polarization is also important. It essentially tells what the orientation of the radio frequency or the RF signal is. Radio waves, as we previously learned, are made up of both electric and magnetic radiation. That is electromagnetic radiation. An electrical field and a magnetic field are oriented perpendicular to each other, or 90 degrees with respect to each other. Polarization defines how the radio waves are oriented with respect to the electric field, not the magnetic field. So this is a better example. If we look at this diagram, we can see that the radio wave has both an electric field in red and a magnetic field in blue. And those two fields are oriented at 90 degrees to each other or perpendicular to each other. Now it looks like the electric field is oriented parallel to the horizon. So in this case, the electric field is in the horizontal plane and thus the radio wave is horizontally polarized. An antenna that is oriented vertically is vertically polarized. So if it's up and down, that's vertical polarization. An antenna that's parallel to the Earth's surface is horizontally polarized. If you were to string two pieces of wire into a dipole and hang them from some trees perpendicular or parallel to the ground, those wires would be horizontally polarized. The transmitting antenna and receiving antenna should have the same polarization for maximal signal reception. If polarization is not the same, less current will be generated in the receiving antenna. So this is something you can try yourself. If you have a small handheld radio with an antenna oriented vertically, you can tune to one of the NOAA weather stations. And the uh, signal should come in fairly strong for your region. If you take that radio and you turn it 90 degrees or have the antenna horizontal with the Earth's surface, you're going to note that the signal drops off significantly. If not, you may not even be able to hear it, depending on how far away from you are, how far away from the antenna you are. So this matters for all types of radio signals. However, it's less so for high frequency radio signals. It's going to matter more so for UHF and VHF uh, radio frequencies. If you get into the HF region where the uh, signals are actually bounced off the ionosphere, those signals are going to undergo uh, some changes to them. So they may not return back to the Earth's surface in the same orientation or polarization that they originally left your radio.
So these waves are said to be elliptically polarized. Vertically and horizontally polarized antennas can receive elliptically polarized sky waves in the case of high frequency radio signals, but the signals may be somewhat degraded. A feed line is a conductor or a set of conductors that physically connects your radio to the antenna. The feed point refers to the connection between the antenna and the feed line. And similar to Ohm's law, the ratio of radio frequency voltage over current is the feed line impedance. As we remember from our previous lecture, impedance combines ohmic resistance and reactance. So impedance is a combination of plain old resistance in a DC circuit with the AC component of reactance. We have to go back also and remember what reactance is composed of. So reactance is the opposition to flow of current similar to resistors, but due to a capacitor or an inductor in an AC circuit. So it's the capacitance or inductance in an AC circuit that provides the resistance to AC flow that makes up the reactance. And the sum of the reactance and the resistance is known as the impedance in a circuit. So it's the overall resistance of a circuit with respect to an AC signal, which is sinusoidal. An antenna is resonant when the feed point impedance is all resistance with no reactance. I know this is a little bit of a hard concept to understand, but just think about what the words are and then go back and study them a little bit. But in this diagram, we can define things a little bit better and hopefully it'll sink in a little bit more. So in something called an oscillator or a tank circuit, we have a capacitor and an inductor. And the capacitor will charge and then release that energy to the inductor. The inductor will charge and release that energy back to the capacitor. So in essence, it's like a teeter-totter or a pendulum, as we reviewed in, in the previous uh, lectures on electrical components. So the energy is going back and forth, back and forth, and essentially oscillating. The point where the capacitive reactants and inductive reactants equal is called resonance, and that's the resonant frequency. But in this case, the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants will cancel each other out. So that means there's no reactance in the circuit. All we're left with is resistance, ohmic resistance. So we can say that an antenna is resonant at that point. The feed point impedance or resistance in a generic concept also changes with frequency. So if you change the frequency of your radio, the feed point impedance is going to change. The feed point impedance also changes with height above ground. So if you take your dipole antenna and you have it maybe 20 feet off the ground and you decide to raise it up to maybe 40 or 50 feet or even higher, that's going to change the feed point impedance and the point of residence for your antenna. So you might have a difference in what's called the standing wave ratio and you'll have to retune that antenna. Feed point impedance is also affected by nearby conductors. So if you have a power line close by or another large piece of metal, that may alter the feed point impedance of your antenna. An antenna is physically made up of several different components. Elements refer to the conducting portions of the antenna where signals are transmitted or received. An array is made up of multiple elements. A driven element is the portion of the antenna that is connected to the feed line. It's physically connected to the feed line. Elements that are not connected to the feed line, but influence the antenna's performance, either directs a signal or reflects a signal, are called parasitic elements. This diagram is of a Yagi antenna, and we can see that the feed line is right here. And this is most likely a piece of what's called coaxial cable. So it's physically connected to the two antenna elements here. This element, since it's connected to the feed line, is called the driven element. And then the element behind it is called the reflector. It is not physically connected to the feed line, but radio waves will emanate from the driven element, go back to the reflector, and actually be reflected and go forward 
to the antenna. This is a directional antenna. So it actually focuses the energy or the RF uh, frequency in a certain direction. The two lines that are in front of the feed line, this one here and here, are called directors. So again, these two elements are not physically hooked up to the feed line, but assist in the antenna's performance. And in this case, they're not reflecting the radio signal, but they're actually directing it to a specific direction. And antennas, as we remember, are not just for transmission, they're for reception. So any radio signal that is going to start at this point is going to be received by the antenna, focused to the coaxial cable by the driven element, and also reflected off the reflector to the driven element. So radio signals generate radio frequency current in the antenna that is detected by the radio receiver. We understand that antennas emit radio frequency energy. Gain is a concept that focuses the antenna's energy. It concentrates the antenna's radiated signal or power in a certain direction. Antenna gain increases signal strength in a specific direction when compared to reference antenna. Gain facilitates communication in a specific direction by increasing transmitted and received signal strength. So gain does not create power. You're not increasing the power of your antenna, but you're increasing the power of your signal because you're directing that energy in a certain direction. Gain focuses power. An isotropic antenna has no gain because it radiates its power equally in all directions. So that's probably going to be on your technician license as a question. An isotropic antenna is a theoretical device used as a reference point only. An omnidirectional antenna radiates signals equally in the horizontal plane. A beam is a directional antenna used for communicating in one direction. So let's use an example of a sprinkler. So we've all seen sprinklers that sprinkle water in a circular pattern in the yard. So that water is going everywhere, 360 degrees around that sprinkler head. However, there are also sprinklers that act as kind of giant squirt guns, and they're going to focus their energy and focus that water pattern in a specific direction. So that sprinkler head specifically has more gain than the omnidirectional sprinkler head has when it distributes its water in 360 degrees in all directions. To use a radio example, let's say we want to communicate with someone in New York City and our station is in Iowa. If we use an omnidirectional antenna, we have the same power and that power is distributed in all 360 degrees. So it's going north, it's going to Canada, it's going south, it's going to Texas, it's going to go west, it's going to go to California, and some of that energy is going to go to New York. So that's an omnidirectional antenna with the same power. However, if we change antennas and get what's called a beam antenna, and a beam antenna is a Yagi antenna that we saw in a few slides before, that antenna has the capacity to direct its power, just like that squirt gun. So instead of spraying water everywhere, we're going to focus our energy of the radio waves, and we're going to turn that antenna towards New York City. This will improve reception and it will also receive improved transmission. So we're not changing the power of the station. We're not trans, we're not changing our transmitted power, but we're focusing our power in a certain direction. Antenna gain and the decibel. So this is a fairly difficult concept to really get down. And it's a difficult concept for me as well. Gain is measured in decibels. It is the relative measure with respect to another reference. So there are two types of references that we use, the DBI and the DBD. The DBI is a decibel with reference to an isotropic antenna. The DBD is in reference to a dipole antenna. So as we remember, the gain is in reference to something. So when we talk about an increase in gain, we refer to DBI when we talk about a isotropic antenna, but when we talk about a dipole antenna, it's DBD in smaller, in a small letter. 
So why use the decibel instead of just simple power gain? So there's a profound difference in the signal strength transmitted to that received, and this requires a lot more simplified notation. Instead of working with huge numbers, use smaller ones. Try to simplify your life. So if we remember a few slides back, we mentioned that a amateur radio antenna can put out more than a kilowatt of power, but it can also receive one ten billionth of a watt of power as well. So that's a huge spread from one ten billionth of a watt to over one kilowatt. So do we want to work with such large numbers or write down such large numbers? Or do we want to have a substitute where we can work with smaller, easier numbers to work with? The decibel essentially measures the ratio of two quantities as a power of 10. A positive dB or positive decibel ratio means that the ratio is greater than one. A negative dB ratio means that the ratio is less than one. So as an example, let's say that we have a signal on our transceiver that puts out one watt and we hook it up to an amplifier and all of a sudden the output goes up to 10 watts. That's a ratio of 10 to one. That's a positive decibel. If we reverse that and have one over 10, that's a negative decibel. So just to review some basic math with respect to the log, let's take a value of three and let's assign X the value of three. If we use log to the base 10 and we take the log of three, we essentially get a value of 0 0.477. So if we punch that into our calculator, the log of three is 0 0.477. But if we go back to basic math, we understand that if we want to take the power of 10, the exponent. So what exponent do we have to raise to the power of 10 to actually get three? So the log of three is 0 0.477. That means we're essentially raising 10 to the X power. I'm sorry, 10 to the 0.477 power, which is the log of three to actually get the value of three. We'll explain in a little bit more detail and uh, examples down the line. So just to review the ratios a little bit more, a signal is amplified again from 5 watts to 10 watts, and the decibel is the ratio of the output to the input. So the output is 10 watts and the input is 5 watts. That gives a ratio value of 2. To get the decibels, we take 10 multiplied by the log of the ratio of 10 over 5, which is the log over 2, and multiply that by 10. Why 10? because deci, as we remember in the units lecture, is 10. So deci is 10, so it's 10 decibels. So we multiply the log of two by 10. So 10 times the log of two equals three. So therefore we have three decibels of gain when we go from five watts to 10 watts. Now there are different equations for calculating the gain in decibels depending on what we're looking for. If we're looking for a power ratio, we multiply 10, multiply the log of the output versus input. And if we're looking for a voltage ratio, we multiply 20, multiplied by the log of the output versus the input. This is a table that depicts what the power ratio is and the decibels are for the equivalent value. So let's say we have a decibel value of zero. What does that mean? It essentially means there's no amplification. So we have a input power of 10 watts and an output power of, of 10 watts. So 10 over 10 is one. So the log of one multiplied is equal to zero decibels. But let's say we have a power ratio of two. So we have a output watts of, let's say, 10 and an input wattage of five. So 10 over five is equivalent to two. And that turns out to be a three decibel increase. Let's look at a power ratio of 10. So we have one watt input and 10 watts output. If we put that through the equation, the log of a ratio of 10 multiplied by 10 will give us a value of 10 decibels. 
And as we go higher, we can see that a power ratio of 1 million will give us 60 decibels. So what's easier to work with? These very large numbers of 1 million, do you want to do math on numbers consisting of 10,000 to a million? Or would you rather work with values in the decibel range of maybe 40 to 60? It's going to be easier understanding the and working with the decibel range instead of the actual ratios. You can go ahead and calculate the logarithms in your calculator. Um, but if you want to a quick and dirty method of just understanding the difference between the power ratio and the decibel, there are some shortcuts you can take. So the first shortcut is if the power ratio doubles, the decibel goes up by three. So as an example, the power goes from two to a value of four. So that essentially doubles. The decibel goes from a value of three to six. If the power ratio goes up by a factor of 10 decibels, or if the power ratio goes up by a factor of 10, the decibel doubles. So let's take an example of an input power of 100, and we amplify that to 1,000 watts. So that goes from a decibel reading of 20 to 30. So the power ratio goes up by a factor of 10, doubles the decibel reading. Okay, let's work through some problems together. So let's say we have a example. We have the basic equation up on top, and we want to figure out how much of a dB gain there is when we have a ratio of an output value of 1500 watts to an input ratio of 10 watts. So we have a radio that generates 10 watts. And an amplifier that will boost that signal to 1500 watts. So that ratio will simplify to 150. So if we plug this into our, our calculator, we'll get a value of 21.8 decibel. So going from 10 watts to 1500 watts is a 21.8 or 22 decibel gain. Let's take another example. So this time we're going to go from a input value of 10 watts. And this time we're going to work for a radio station. So let's go up to 50,000 watts. So we're really boosting our signal. And if we re reduce that ratio, the numeric value is going to be 5,000. So log to the base 10 of 5,000 multiplied by 10 will give us a 37 decibel increase in power. Now the last example, I'm going to do something a little bit different. So let's say we're actually receiving a radio signal. So we're going to use the same equation. But this time, our value for the numerator is going to be 0 0.00002 watts. And the value for the denominator is going to be that 50,000 watt value. So let's plug that into our calculator and we're going to get a negative value, a negative 83 decibel decline. So that's negative 83 dB. So the first one was 21.8, the second one was 37, and finally negative 83 when we reverse the ratio.
So these are much simpler numbers to work with rather than the large numbers. So decibels are going to simplify your life. A better way of looking at an antenna's gain is through the radiation pattern. The radiation pattern is a graphical way of depicting how radio frequency energy radiates from the antenna. An azimuthal pattern or azimuthal pattern is essentially looking down from above and seeing the horizontal distribution of radio waves. So let's say you have your vertical antenna in your backyard and you all of a sudden have a bird's eye view of that antenna. You're essentially looking down at that antenna from above. That's the azimuthal or azimuthal pattern. The elevation pattern is the exact opposite. So you're standing maybe 50 feet away from your vertical antenna on the same plane, and you're looking at it from a straight on angle. The antenna radiation pattern changes with different frequencies. There are different lobes of the radiation pattern. The main lobe is considered the portion of the radiation pattern with the greatest gain or the largest gain, largest lobe. The side lobes are the regions with lower gain and nulls are regions where the gain is minimal to nothing. Now we can use these lobes to calculate certain ratios. The front to back ratio is the ratio of the preferred forward gain to the opposite direction. And the front to side ratio is the ratio of the forward gain to the gain at 90 degrees with respect to the forward gain. So this is a lot easier if we draw things out. So this is the azimuthal radiation pattern. And as we can, as we mentioned before, this is a bird's eye view. You're essentially looking down at your antenna from above. So A up here is the main lobe. So you can see this is a directional antenna. The area depicted in purple is the radiation pattern of the antenna. This is not an omnidirectional antenna. It is all going towards zero degrees and really nothing towards 180 degrees. So C should be considered a null and A should be considered the main lobe. And we, when we talk about front to back ratios or front to side ratios, we're going to look at the main lobe A in comparison to C. So that's front to back ratio. And when we do the front to side ratio, we're going to look at the main lobe A to the lobe 90 degrees from that radiation pattern or B on either side. And if you look here, you can see that the gain is a little bit less. So the front to side ratio gain is going to be less than the front to back ratio. To put this more simply, let's say that the antenna is pointing north and you want to talk to and you're in Illinois and you want to talk to somebody in Canada. So you point your antenna north and this is going to be a, a perfect direction for your antenna since it has all the gain uh, that's headed north. You're pointing your direct in, direction north. Now, if you have a radio station someplace in the south, let's say you're in uh, New Orleans and you're still in Illinois, but you're talking to the person in Canada, that person in New Orleans is going to be at your null region or C. They're not going to be able to hear you. You're pointing all your energy or gain up north and you're not going to be able to hear them because you're not, the antenna is not receiving their signal. So if you have unwanted signals, if you have somebody who's really interfering with your transmission or reception that's close by in frequency, having a directional antenna will be very beneficial. Or if you have some type of interference that's coming from a certain direction, you can point your, your antenna uh, away from that interference and listen to or talk to somebody else. Now, this is the horizontal radiation pattern. This is not a top-down view. You're essentially standing on the same plane as your antenna and looking at it horizontally. And if we look at 
that top portion of this lobe, this essentially goes straight up. So it goes straight up into the sky. So this lobe would actually be good for NVIS or near vertical incident skyway propagation. So you're on, uh, 80 meters or 160 meters and you're in Wisconsin and you want to talk to somebody in northern Wisconsin, this would be a decent radiation pattern for NVIS. So the signal is going to go straight up to the ionosphere and bounce almost right back down uh, throughout the state. So that's a good lobe to have in a antenna system if you want to do NVIS. But you can see that the side lobes are have a little more gain. So it's all the way out to the zero dB region as opposed to the, let's say, negative four dB region. So the main lobes on the side are going to have more gain than the lobe going up and down. And you can see that there is a region with almost, not almost zero gain, but significantly lower than the rest. This is called the null area, and you can see null areas on both sides. So if we look at the lobes, the main lobe here is, let's just roughly estimate, this is going to be at, oh, let's say a 30 degree angle. So that 30 degree angle is going to go up in the sky, bounce off the ionosphere, and come back down someplace else. So let's say that signal will go to England. So the angle of the angle relative to the horizon is relatively small. But if you had a lobe, a significant lobe or a main lobe at that null region, that would have a higher takeoff angle. And that takeoff angle would be, let's say, 45 to maybe 50 degrees. And that may get you to Iceland. So it go, goes up and bounces off the ionosphere and comes back down. But in this case, you're going to have a null region. So you're going to skip Iceland. You're going to skip Greenland. And you're going to have a sh more shallow takeoff angle for your RF pattern that may propagate all the way to, to Europe. Okay, everybody, that about wraps it up for this presentation on antenna core concepts. So today we've learned about antennas, polarization, gain, and how to calculate decibels, as well as review and introduce antenna radiation patterns. In future lectures, we're going to review certain and specific types of antennas, which will be actually pretty fun. So thanks for joining us. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if uh, you feel so inclined, please uh, visit our Radio Signals website and support us. Thanks and 73. See you next time.